campers gathering in, but we are going to get started this morning. Welcome to Old Fashioned Sunday. If you haven't noticed, you haven't gone back in time. When you look around, you go, wow, these folks at this church dress very in a very interesting manner. No, we're, we're celebrating our heritage this morning, and we are excited to have you with us as we do this morning. Let me give you a couple things about today that are quite special, and that is, first of all, if you stop by the coffee shop, which is right outside the main sanctuary entrance, you stop by there, you will see that there is uh, a whole display of pictures. Those pictures go back a long time. Now, I'm going to be careful because some of you are in those pictures, and if I say too long, you might get upset at me. No, those pictures go back, I think, there are pictures back there as far back as even the 50s uh, in some of those pictures. So check that out. Go by the coffee shop before you leave and check out those pictures. Uh, an amazing display of our history. Also, make sure you stop out in the courtyard. So we're going to send you two different directions, but it'll be good because there's a lot of people going to be wanting to take pictures. We've got a, a photo booth out there. Uh, I, th- I guess Pastor Neil rode his tractor to church this morning and parked it out there in the middle. No, there's a photo booth out there with, a, with an antique tractor and some other things and a, a nice spot for you to get your picture taken. Uh, so get out there and get that done. And then you guys, since it is Old Fashioned Sunday and everybody rode their buckboard wagon, it's going to take them a while to get home. You guys have something to help them out with lunch. We got you some snacks for on the way back if you uh, didn't see on the way in. Uh, There's several tables set up out there with all kinds of baked goods on them. Now, with the cakes and stuff, there is uh, an auction going on. You'll see a sheet beside it, uh, so you can can run your bid there. Uh, Make sure it's your max bid because you don't want to get outbid on uh, on Miss Mary's Pound Cake. So you don't want to get outbid, so stop out there, uh, uh, put your your bids down and everything, and then the winner, uh, you can take it home after church, or if you have already left and you win, uh, we will give you a call, and you can... uh, um, so yeah, that all, all this, all the funds that are raised go to uh, help our students uh, with this fall retreat that we are about to undergo. So the, it, it's just the the above and the beyond stuff, the uh, the extra fun stuff that, that we would that we enjoy doing, uh, and this would go to help support that. We're going to let you know about one other thing that's happening today. Today at three o'clock. Say three o'clock. Three o'clock. All right. Say it one more time. Say three o'clock. Three o'clock. All right. Today at three o'clock. Our kids, Garden Sanctuary kids, are going to be meeting at Cherry Place Farm. Now there, there's a a corn maze, there's a pumpkin patch, there's a petting zoo, all those typical things for the fall visit. Now here's what's cool. All the kids, Garden Sanctuary kids, are free. That includes their admission, that includes if they want to take a pumpkin home, that's going to be free. Mom and Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, we'd love to have you come out. We want you to come. You'll have to pay your own admission, but the kids are free, and so that's exciting, and we're excited to get out there with our Garden Sanctuary families this afternoon. So we're not going to make a bunch of announcements. We will tell you about one more thing, and that is coming up on the 7th. And on the 7th, Sunday the 7th, is our Buy a Tree, Change a Life volunteer kickoff. All right, that night, if you want to be a Buy a Tree, Change a Life volunteer, somebody says, what's Buy a Tree, Change a Life? It's when we sell Christmas trees each year. We sell them for a few weeks beginning on Black Friday, and every penny, every penny, say every penny, every penny of the profit goes to change lives of children here in Rock Hill and globally through for, through people for care and learning. It's an exciting opportunity. If you come out that night, we're going to do some training, but we're going to do some fun things. We're going to have some giveaways. It's going to be a great time. So come out on November the 7th at 5 p.m. And you know what? Tell them about the 14th, which is the fall gathering. The 14th is the fall gathering that we have ho- that we have had in years past out here in the parking lot. That's the thing with all the inflatables, with all the, the good food, the hangouts, the uh, the, the bond, or not, not bonfire, the fire pits. The bond uh, bonfire. Yeah, the bonfires. <laughs> uh, so all that is coming up November the 14th. It is an incredible uh, day, th- something to bring your family out to, uh, something for all ages. So there, we'll have the game set up, we'll have the hay ride, we'll have uh, all those things. Uh, that will be November the 14th. 
All right. So those are some things that are happening. Some more announcements will be coming up in the weeks ahead. Remember, you can always go over to Gardensanctuary.org and find the calendar there. We're trying to keep that full uh, or keep that updated as the calendar fills up and let you know more things that are coming our way. At this time, we're going to get into our worship this service this morning. How many of us are glad to be in God's house today? Amen. It's old-fashioned Sunday. We got up early this morning, got the fire stoked, and got the stove. And no, I'm just kidding. But it, it's a wonderful Sunday. And look, we're having fun today. We're remembering our heritage. We're going to go out. We're going to see the historical display in the coffee shop. We're going to buy some baked goods. We're going to go out and take our picture. We're going to do all those things. And we're going to come to church, and we're going to look around and see folks that are dressed out of a different era. And all that's great and grand and beautiful and wonderful. But for a few minutes, I think it would be all right if we just take time to celebrate a God that has not changed with the times. And to remember that we are here on Old Fashioned Sunday to remember and thank God for our heritage, but also to be reminded that His kingdom is a kingdom that was, a kingdom that is, and a kingdom that is to come. Amen? So let's have fun today. Let's have a great time, but let's worship the Lord together. Linwood's coming to read our scripture this morning, and we're going to begin worship. It's old-fashioned, son. Of course, I could talk loud enough. I thought Neil was going to say... Won the pound cake and you left early that he was going to give you a call and say it was very good. Uh, we're glad you left it behind. Uh, thank you for the donation. Anyway, would you stand for the reading of God's word? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Amen. <laughs> good morning. Well, I'm going to pray this morning. Pastor kind of stole what I was going to say, but I'm grateful that the anointing isn't just of yesteryears but it is today. The anointing breaks the yoke. And I am grateful that even though our grandparents and those that have gone on and those that are still here have prayed and they have prayed for healing and the power of the Holy Spirit has come and washed over the church that today I still can teach my daughters that when you call on Jesus' name, that that is what's going to take you to the throne. So today, I want you to help me pray. We're going to ask the Lord that not only that his presence would hover this place, but that the anointing would, we, would come in and just consume every part of this service. Can you help me pray? I need your help. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for each and every person, God, that is represented here. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would bring the anointing. God, we understand that the anointing breaks the yoke. I ask you, God, that through the the ministry of the song and the pastor preaching God in the word. I pray God in the name of Jesus that you would be among us God. I ask you Lord that you would come down God any need that we have I pray that you touch us. I pray God any healing that is needed in this room God that somebody walks out God and the same power of the Holy Spirit that we used to feel God and we remember when we're reminded God that could be felt today God that 
that the healing power, God, would just rush all over this place. In the name of Jesus, anoint us. In Jesus' name, amen. this morning has never gotten old to me it's amazing grace God's grace is sufficient for all of us this morning so worship with us Worship with us as we sing at the cross. Cross at the cross. 
morning. Worship with us as we sing. I can't remember the other song. Power in the blood. Oh, there's power in the blood. Man, there is there's so much power in the blood of Jesus. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Worship with us.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anybody this morning thankful for the blood of Jesus? Thankful that the blood of Jesus worked. The blood of Jesus worked for the man who hung beside him on the cross. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me. The blood of Jesus worked when Stephen, the first martyr, looked up and saw in the heavens God the Father and seated at his right hand the Son. The blood of Jesus worked. The blood of Jesus worked when a man named Saul had been breathing out threatenings, had been murdering Christians. When that man named Saul encountered Jesus on his way to do more wrong, the blood of Jesus worked. The blood of Jesus worked for the New Testament church. where where Paul writes to the church and he looks at them and says uh, all these sinful things and as the church we're so quick to often look at the world and tell them what's wrong with them but Paul doesn't let the church get away with it he says and such were some of you the blood of Jesus works the blood of Jesus worked uh, when kings came and went when kingdoms rose and fell uh, When men and women came on the scene and went away, the answer that still set men and women free from their sin was the blood of Jesus. And still today, it is the blood of Jesus that will change lives. Can we one more time give thanks for the blood? Hallelujah. You can be seated this morning. And I could just sing these old songs all day long. Aren't we thankful uh, for those that put in time and effort this morning to to lead us in worship? Amen. How many enjoyed those hymns this morning? Amen. It is so good to see all of you in the house of the Lord today. I want to remind you, get out there to the coffee shop. Take a look at those pictures they're historical and hysterical. No, go check out those, uh, those pictures through the history of the church. You will enjoy that thoroughly, those pictures that are out there. Also, stop by the courtyard, and out there you can take uh, a photo at the photo booth area, and I know that you will, uh, you'll enjoy that, have something to remember today by. Also, if you are in the room today and you are a guest Let me, uh, first of all, assure you that you do not have to wear a bonnet to come to church here. It's Old Fashioned Sunday. We're remembering our heritage. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. Can we just celebrate any guests that are in the room today? We're so glad that you're here. And we also want to say that as a guest, we want you to ignore this next part, but we want to talk about giving for just a moment. I do so appreciate, and the church is so appreciative of your faithfulness in giving. If you're a guest... We just want you to come and enjoy the blessing of the Lord. But if you are part of the Garden Sanctuary family, if this is where you and your family are fed, we want you to continue to sow into what God is doing here and around the world. You can give. You can point your camera right there at the screen. Grab that QR code. Go right to the site and give online. You can also give anytime. Go to gardensanctuary.org. You'll find a giving link. You can also give cash or check. It's Old Fashioned Sunday, right? Don't leave out cash or check. You can give uh, with cash or check right there in the uh, foyer right outside the main sanctuary entrance. So once again, we're so glad to see all of you here today. And Garden Sanctuary Kids will be going over to Cherry Place today at 3 o'clock. We want you to be part of that. Could we stand for the reading of the Word this morning? Aren't you thankful that God's Word never changes? Aren't you thankful God's Word never changes? I've discovered there's a lot of things in the world that are changing. Every day it gets more absurd, the things that are changing. But God's Word is always the same. And I'm grateful for that, that we have a solid, faithful, timeless Word that comes from a timeless God that has not changed and is not going to change, and in fact could not change because it's not in Him to change. Aren't you glad we have a reliable God? Amen? Amen. Who knows what they're going to tell us has changed when we go to the house today? Who knows what this week we're going to find out is not the way it's always been? 
something that we've always defined as going to be up for question. But I'm glad to know I can go back to this book and find out that it is true. It is faithful. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Let's read together if we would. We're familiar with this by now. Pray then like this. Now all together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We want to pray this morning. I did get a message that uh, Brenda Goss's mother had fallen this morning. They were on the way to take her to the emergency room, so we want to pray for her when we pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we pray for this need, that you would move in that situation, that your hand would be there. Lord, that you would be there to comfort. Lord, you would be there to heal. Lord, we're believing for your hand upon this life today. Father, we pray now for this moment we are in. Lord, we pray, God, that you would anoint your word. Your word is perfect, but I am ever more reminded I am an imperfect servant. So I come today with the task of rightly dividing your word, and I pray that in an act of divine mercy, you would anoint my lips of clay with a coal from heaven's fire. Lord, I pray that you would anoint ears in this room to be open to hear your word. Lord, I pray you would anoint minds to be ready to comprehend your word, to put off distractions. Lord, I pray that hearts would be humble to submit to your word. I pray, Lord, that souls would be comforted by your word, that spirits would be refreshed by your word. And when we leave this place that we'll leave celebrating, that our lives have been changed by your word. Let me say not one word too much, not one too little, but let everything be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for what we know you'll do. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm going to help the preacher preach today. Or I'll buy you two extra things at the bake sale. Trying to help you, Pastor Neil. Communication is important. How we communicate is important. That we communicate is important. We connect through our communication, but it's, it's also important that we understand the level of connection when we do communicate. You know, sometimes you move from one place to another, communication can be quite different. We were talking the other day about the word barbecue. When you think barbecue here, most people think some sort of pork product prepared over smoke. It's pork. You go other states, it's beef. Some places, it's mamwich. Wherever that place is, the Spirit of the Lord does not reside. I will tell you that. They need a missionary. <laughs> Wherever you go, it can mean a different thing. It's actually, really, it's about the, the, the process. Where I grew up, when you said barbecue, we just thought a cookout. Then I came down here and I discovered you have a restaurant called Cookout. But you have cookouts where you eat inside. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. I heard of a pastor one time who had grown up in the city, and he, he, he was grown up, he was so much in the city that he didn't know anything about cows or anything about farms or anything like that, and, and he, he literally barely knew a cow from an ear of corn, the saying goes, and so he finally married a small town girl from the country, and he moved from the great big center of New York City out into this rural community, and when he moved out there, they asked him to preach. And so when he got up to preach, if you're not used to the crowd sometimes, you'll try to connect, you'll try to tell them a little bit about yourself, you'll try to let them know, you know, get over those barriers between the speaker and the crowd. And so he tried to fit in, but he, he probably tried a little too hard because he looked at the crowd and with his bride sitting on the front pew, he said, I never saw a cow until I met my wife. Not a good day. 
not, not a good day. The story was told of a person who knocked on the front door of a house. They had a sign out front saying that they needed some work done. So I need some work. Please come bid on repair projects. Well, a man was walking by, saw it, knocks on the door. He says, uh, what kind of work do you need done? She says, well, can you paint? And he says, yeah, I'm a pretty good painter. And she says, okay, great. There's two gallons of green paint back there in the shed, and you'll find a brush back there, and there's a porch out there that needs to be painted. You do a good job, and I'll pay you what it's worth. He said, that's fine, I'll do it. I should be able to do that quickly. A Porsche, you say, yeah, absolutely. So he goes out back and he, he gets to work painting. Finally, he comes back around to the front porch where she's sitting. He says, well, I've got it all done. She says, great. She says, you finished it all. She says, my, that was fast. He said, yes, ma'am, I finished it all. She said, well, did you do a good job? He said, ma'am, he said, I think I did a good job, but there's something I need to point out to you. I don't want to correct you. You hired me. But that's not a Porsche, that's a Mercedes. Communication without connection can be a problem. You know, we've been talking about connecting with God because it's more important when we look at the Lord's Prayer that we connect than that we communicate, if you will. Oftentimes we're communicating with God, we're repeating prayers, we're saying things, we're going through the motions, but what we end up with is not that I've not communicated to Him, or not that I've not even read His Word and been communicated to by Him, but I don't feel like I'm connected with Him. In fact, you can read your Bible, be communicated to from God. You can pray, communicate to God, and still feel like you're not connected to God. Anybody ever felt like that? See, Jesus had told them how to connect, and he tells them how to connect through a prayer. Now, one thing I want to point out to you is Jesus didn't just tell them that they weren't good at connecting to God. He told them the proper way to connect to God. That's how Jesus is a lot different than the church is sometimes. The church is really good at telling people what's wrong with them without modeling how to do it right. Somebody say amen. See, here's the thing. God won't just show you what's wrong. If you listen, God will show you how to do it right. And so Jesus says, let me show you how to connect to the Father. And he starts out with this prayer. Again, we call it the Lord's Prayer. Really, it's our prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. It's the one he told us to use. He starts out, our Father, we've talked about that, having a Father in heaven, who art in heaven. We talked about the fact that that means He's not just in another realm. I have a promise of a world beyond this one, but I also have a promise that He's in all three heavens, which means this atmosphere that I walk under and in. Last week we talked about hallowed be thy name, about lifting Him up, making His name holy, glorifying Him in all that we do. You know, it's amazing to me that most of what we pray about concerns us asking for things for whom? For us. Amen. We go to God and we pray about our situations, about our stuff. But Jesus says, if you want to connect, let me show you how to connect. And when this prayer of connecting prayer occurs, the first three things, we've been preaching this for weeks, and we haven't talked about us yet. We haven't mentioned me and mine and my needs and my stuff and what I'm going through. All the way through the first three petitions that we see, the first things that are asked, we come, we acknowledge who it's to. We, we acknowledge where he is. We acknowledge that we glorify him. And now we're going to start asking God for things. Is anybody excited to start asking God for things? We get excited about that, don't we? You can name it and claim it. You can blab it and grab it, right? Hocus, pocus, bring it into focus. Decree and declare. We love all that. We love that idea that we're going to make a demand. But I want to show you what the first things are that we actually ask God for. The first things that we ask God for have nothing to do with us. The first thing we ask Him is make your name holy. 
not bless me, not touch me, not help me. Let your name be glorified. My first request is, God, would you please be glorified? My, my second request comes today, thy kingdom come. Wait a second. I made a request. I said praise his name. Now can I get down to me? No. Thy kingdom come. The third thing, all right, all right, all right. I've got churchy, Pastor. I've said, I've said, Lord, you know, your name be glorified. I've said your kingdom come. You return. You establish your rule. I've said all those things. Now can I tell him what I want? Nope. Spoiler alert, that's not in this prayer. <laughs> thy kingdom be established and then thy will be done. Now, this is interesting to me. I have a problem with this. You know, we sing songs sometimes where when we sing them, we talk about, you know, God's name being holy. We sing a song about exalting God. We sing all these things. And you ask yourself a question. Why are we praying, Lord, your kingdom be established? Isn't his kingdom already established? Isn't he already the king? Why are we going to prayer and saying, God, let your kingdom be established? Psalm 103 and 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Say established. Now, I'm no English teacher, but established looks like it's past tense to me. Right? Right? It, it looks like it's something that has already occurred. God has already established his throne. But it seems like even though his throne has been established, there must be some area over which his rule is not recognized. There must be some place where there's some entity that says, you're not really the king. You're not really in charge. And when we look at that, we go, my goodness, where could it be that he's not in charge? We know he rules over all creation. The scripture tells us that he tells the oceans where to stop. We know that he rules over the weather because we know that he set things in motion. You read the scriptures and it tells us that he set things in motion and he did things with the rules of physics that cannot be changed, that he did that. We know that he rules over the, the idea of creation and he rules over all of creation because he spoke and out of nothing came something. Someone said, well, what is the nothing that he brought stuff out of? Nothing is the stuff that rocks dream about. Never mind. He brought something from nothing that was beyond the nothingness that you and I can get our minds around. So we know he reigns over creation. We know he established uh, the universe to be set in its way. We know uh, that whenever we think all the way through the history of his creation, when we think of everything from a, from a, a, a plate in the earth's surface shifting uh, to the way that the, the, the earth orbits the sun, to the way uh, that there's another planet near us just to pull away uh, the, the asteroids that might strike us, but they get pulled in to that planet's gravity. Uh, we understand that God has finely tuned this thing. We know that he rules over all creation. So if he rules over all creation, I've got to find the place, Jamie Spargo, where he does not rule because I'm praying, God, you want me to pray something. Help me, help me, help it make sense. Why am I praying that your kingdom be established if you're already king of the universe? What am I praying about so someone would say well he rules over all of creation here but it's those demons it's those devils it's those imps it's those fallen angels they're the ones that disobey him but you know what I noticed every time Jesus encountered a demon and spoke to them they obeyed him Every time Jesus encountered them, they obeyed him. Every time he said, go and don't come again, they went and didn't come again. 
So I say, wait a second, if he rules over the animals and the plants and the trees and the wind and the universe and the laws of physics, if he rules over the things in such a way that a man named Einstein comes up with a theory called the theory of relativity that points to the fact that God created it all. Someone said, was there a big bang? I know God said it and bang, it happened. We know that science tells us that everything is laid out. So everything is following after. After God, he's in control of everything. So what on earth am I praying when I'm praying your kingdom be established? Where is he not recognized as king? He's recognized in all the earth. If I go down to hell, he's recognized there. Death knows he's the king. Satan knows he's the king. Every demon he encountered knows he's the king. In fact, we could learn something from demons. Demons always did two things that we struggle to do. They worshipped him and they obeyed him. Mm. It's old-fashioned Sunday, but I think they used to say amen too. Mm. You see, in the hearts of my, the hearts and minds of men and women, that's the only place that he's not king. The places we govern is the only place he's not king. You go to the African savanna, he's king. You go down to the, the heights of the Andes Mountains, and he's the king. You climb to the, to the tallest peak in Tibet, and he's the king. But if you go into the hearts of men and women, if you go into the places where we rule and reign, Go into the places that we call our courthouses and our state houses and our seats of government and you will discover that you have found the place that God doesn't rule. The only place that God's authority is not recognized is in the heart of man. You say, Pastor, I don't know about that. I believe that he's the king. Oh, yes, we claim to bend the knee. We claim to call him Lord, but we spend far more time serving our interests than we do his. We spend far more time considering what's good for us than we do what's good for him. We claim he is king. I want to tell you something that wrecked my world. I shared it the other day. I went and sat down last week with the dean of the School of Religion at Lee University. And as we were talking, I shared with him what a young man had shared online. I had a guy that I had connected with online. He came in, he used to comment on my, a lot of things I would say. I just kept being gracious with him, kept being gracious with him. I'm going to win him to Jesus. He's actually uh, an atheist that lives in Canada. He's a scientist. And I don't know how, again, I don't know how he found my stuff, but he got, and he finally got to where now he's not confrontational. We have good conversations about things, and I'm, I'm hoping to win him to Jesus. But here's the thing. He had posted something, and one of his friends had commented on it. He was posting about the fraudulentness of Christians. And one of his friends, who seemed to be speaking from an atheist position, said something that rocked my world. He said, the thing is, he said, Christians claim that church is God's house, but they don't go. They claim the Bible is God's word, but they don't read it. Now, this is coming not from a believer. He said, they claim the Bible's God's word, but they don't read it. They claim that God's ways are the way to live their life, but they don't follow his teachings. And this atheist concluded, and it broke my heart. But he convicted me. He said, I am convinced that they don't believe it at all. They just believe in believing in something. That's when you say amen and send an offering to the atheist. That's when you say that God is raising up voices <laughs> that don't even know him to speak. You see, we say God is king. We live our lives in ways that don't follow his teaching. We say he's the king. We come in and we sing, oh, king of my heart. And I won't try to sing it because I lost the tune right there. <laughs> we sing that, 
But do we live like he's king of our heart? We live like we are. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Galatians says. We say that we live by Galatians. We proclaim, like Paul says in Romans chapter 12, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, uh, going over to Romans chapter 12. Uh, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies uh, as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And I can't help but go back to my King James roots, uh, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable. How is it reasonable? If he's God, then following him ought to be easy, if I really believe that he's God. But despite all of our proclamations that he's king of my heart, that he's Lord of all, that I follow him, that I serve him, that he is the main thing, despite our bumper stickers and our t-shirts, despite the cool music videos, despite all the stuff that churchianity puts around the world, I believe our lives don't fit what Paul wrote. Our lives fit more like the fourth stanza of Henley's Invictus, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. We say he's in charge, but we live like we are. Sometimes it slips through even into our bumper stickers, Jesus is my co-pilot. What we're saying is I want to live my life the way I want to live it, but I want him there with me in case I get in the ditch. I've discovered I don't want him to be my co-pilot. And in fact, I don't want to sit up front. I don't want to run the radio. I don't want to sit in the back seat and be the back seat driver. I want to get in the trunk and say, Jesus, you take me where you're going, and when we get there, you let me out. But doesn't that sound like us? Doesn't Henley in the, that famous Invictus, doesn't, doesn't he sound like us? I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I will live my truth. Let's celebrate people for following their truth. There is no your truth. There is no my truth. There's only the truth. And it's my job to find the truth and follow the truth. Y'all aren't going to help the pastor this morning. That's all right. That sounds like us laying out our plans, crafting our ideas, creating our, our mode for going through life, serving our own purposes, fulfilling our own pleasures, all under the strange delusion that we are in control. Oh, it goes all the way back to the garden. Come on. Do what he told you not to do. You'll be like God. Do what he told you to do. No old book's going to run you. No old fogey way of thinking's going to run you. It's old-fashioned Sunday. No old-fashioned idea is going to run you. Come and taste and see what he told you not to. And actually... Let me remind you where Satan started. Did he really say that? Remember that's where Satan started. Did he really say that? Can I just tell somebody on Old Fashioned Sunday? He really said this. He really said this. All 1,189 chapters rightly divided in their context, he said every word of it. And I don't care how much society changes or culture changes, God still said what he said. And don't think we're so woke that we got new knowledge and new information. They thought they were woke in Rome and Rome fell apart. They thought they were woke in Greece and Greece fell apart. They thought they were woke in France and France fell apart. Every nation that thinks it wakes from God's truth falls into destruction every single time. He said it. 
So I have to remind us this morning there's still only one who is in control. Only one who controls faith. Only one uh, who can direct your path. Pastor, I pray and I can't connect. Uh, That's one reason uh, we keep skipping that line. Your kingdom, your will. Uh, I can't come to him and say, Lord, I lift you up. Uh, I praise heaven while I live like hell. Now give me what I want. I have to remind us that there's only one who can control our path. There are many governments. You want to travel right now, you've got to find out what the rules are for the government you're traveling to. You've got to find out if you can go to their country. You've got to find out what you've got to do. You've got to get a test. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. What do you have to do? Why? Why? Because every nation, as God ordained it, every nation has rule over that which occurs within its borders. But I have to remind us of something. There is no end to the kingdom of God. You don't get to the border and check in or check out. There is no customs agent to say, actually, you know, let me take that back. There is customs saying you can come in, but you can't bring everything with you. So Jesus lays out if we're going to connect with God, we have to establish a desire to see his governance. Thy kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Somebody say that with me this morning. Your kingdom come. Say it. Your kingdom come. What, what, what if we really meant that? Into my home. Your, here, come with me. Your kingdom come. Into my marriage. Your kingdom come come. Into our church, your kingdom come. Into my plans, your kingdom come. In my career, your kingdom come. In my relationships, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Establish your rule. Let your kingdom rule in my life that everything I do, I do as unto a king. I feel like I need to remind us that the kingdom of God is not a democracy. We don't get to vote on God's will. We don't get to get the numbers together and decide. I need to remind us that he's a king. He's a monarch. And what that means is he does what he does. And we get in line with what he does. He says what he says and we get in line with what he says. Can I take you to the end? We'll, we'll have a little eschatology later too. Uh, but we're reminded that when he rules and reigns on earth for a thousand years, not everybody he's ruling is going to love him. But the scripture says he will rule with what? With a rod of iron. They'll be so fearful to come against God in the flesh uh, that they won't step against him. Uh, can I remind you this morning, uh, it doesn't matter whether they love him or hate him. Uh, every knee will bow to him. But see, Christianity struggles with Jesus the king. We struggle. We like Jesus the baby. We like Jesus in the cradle. Oh, pretty little baby. The world was so dark and he came in and he shone and brought me hope. We like that, don't we? We like a baby Jesus that we can pick up and carry around. We like a baby Jesus. See, babies, all they need is attention. They don't, they they need my attention, but they don't really give me orders. We like baby Jesus. Let me, I got baby Jesus. I'm going to go to church and pop a pacifier in baby Jesus. Oh, I like baby Jesus. Let me carry him around. And people tell me how cute my Christianity is. And people tell me how wonderful my Christianity is. Can can I just tell you something this morning? The the new thing on social media is red flags. If the world loves everything you say about Christianity, that's a red flag. Because they hated him and they'll hate you if you're really following him. He, he, He in the cradle is one we love. We love him. He's hope. Can I tell you, we even love Jesus on the cross. Dying for my sins. Suffering in a way that no one could ever imagine. Because on the cross, he's my help. I love when he's my hope and I love when he's my help. 
I love when he's up there on the cross and, and I know I can take my burdens and the blood of Jesus cleanses me. And I, All those things are wonderful. But we struggle. The crib is okay. And the, the, the cross is all right. We'll celebrate that. But we struggle with the crown. Because the baby I get to carry where I want, that's an okay Jesus. And the one on the cross that I get to come to with my trouble, that's an okay Jesus. But the one with the crown that says I'm the king, and if you're one of mine, you're going to do it my way, that's not the Jesus we like. That's not the Jesus we want. King over my heart, king over the universe, king over the government. That's not the Jesus we want. But can I tell somebody this morning, yes, he is a sacrifice. He paid the cost for my sins and thank God for it. Is there anybody glad that he paid the price for your sins? I thank God for that. And he is a priest. What do you mean? I mean he took his own shed blood. He walked into the Holy of Holies. He applied it to the heaven's mercy seat. And then the veil was rent so that you and I could enter into the presence of God and ultimately could enter into heaven. Oh, he is a priest. But he's not just a sacrifice. And he's not just a priest. But my Bible tells me that he is the king. He is the king and it is time for God's church to rise up and say Christ is king he's king in our church he's king in our homes he's king in our lives when I turn on my radio he's the king when I turn on my TV he's the king when I have a conversation he's the king when I choose where I'm going he's the king and I don't do what pleases me I do what pleases him cause he is the king I gotta tell somebody Jesus isn't on the cross anymore you're not serving a baby in a cradle you're not serving a broken man on a cross you are serving the ruling reigning God of the universe we better remember that mercy is the cross but he's the king there's a group of people following Jesus. A whole crowd's coming after him. He stops. He says, hold on. I need to tell you something. You're going to follow me. You have to take up your cross. Notice he didn't say, I'll carry the cross. We like his cross. We don't like ours. He said, you'll take up your cross. If I have a cross, that means I'm going to what? Die. That means my will's going to die. My way's going to die. My desires are going to die. And guess what? Sometimes it's painful and it hurts. Dying's not fun. Dying doesn't feel good. But Jesus looks at him and he says, let me tell you. He said, nobody builds a tower lest they count the cost. Because if you do build a tower and you didn't count the cost, you won't finish the job. And then everybody's going to ride by and go, look at them. They thought they could do it. They didn't have the money to finish the project. Anybody ever seen a house like that got built, some monstrosity in the middle of it? The business owner went bankrupt, and there it sits, halfway done. Jesus says, you don't want that. And then he tells them this. He looks at them and he says, you don't go to war unless you figure it out the power of who you are, how many are with you. You figure out the power of how many are against you, and then you go to war. That's what he said, the same verse. The same paragraph, he says, you count your army. Now, who is he talking about going to war? He just said, if you're going to follow me, you got to take up your cross and die. So he's saying to them that you're going to war with something. What are they going to war with? They're going to war with God's kingdom. You say, Pastor, what, you, what do you mean? I came to tell you this morning, if you're not living your life in obedience to God, then you are at war against him. There is no middle. This is rough preaching, isn't it? There is no middle. You're either with him 
or you are at war against him. And Jesus looks. He looks at a whole crowd of people that are following him for the miracles and the loaves and the fishes and all the stuff. And he says, you better figure it out. It's going to cost you something to follow me. Uh, and then he says, you better figure this out. There is a kingdom standing at the edge of your heart. Uh, there is one coming. Uh, and if you're ready to go to war with God, uh, you better figure out how strong you are. Uh, and here's the thing. Uh, every one of us today has to recognize that there comes a point uh, in our life uh, that the king rides up uh, to the edge of our heart's domain uh, and he looks at us uh, and he says I created you uh, and I'm going to rule you uh, now will you willingly submit uh, or will I have to break you uh, that's what he says uh, will you bend the knee now uh, or will you bend it in eternity uh, when you can't be with me uh, he looks at us and says uh, but before you fight me uh, you better figure out how strong I am Oh, he's the king. See, we want to pray all these things. Jesus said, Pastor, why are my prayers ineffectual? Because you're still praying to a broken man on a cross. You're not praying to a king on a throne. Revelation chapter 19. Somebody says, Pastor, this is really rough, man. What about all this? Let me tell you what's coming. See, I, I, we need to break the idea of this fairy tale Jesus. Western Christianity has given us a sissified hippie Jesus. They've given us a socialist who's out just to give away and expect nothing back. They've not given us, they've not given us one who said, go and sin no more. They've given us one that forgives the sinner, but they've, they've forgotten to tell us that he said, he looks at the crowd and says, hey, you remember all those people that just got crushed by that skyscraper that fell on them the other day? If you don't repent, you'll also likewise perish. We forget about him, don't we? We forget about the one that made the whip and started judgment in the house of God. And somebody said, Pastor, why don't we preach to the people out there about what they're doing? I'll tell you why. Because judgment begins right here in this house. I'm not convinced we can ever think he'll be king of D.C. if he's not king of 831 Cedar Street. Lord help us. I'm going to preach it to you anyway. So. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, verse 11, says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. What you mean, Pastor? I thought, I thought, you said, I thought Jesus came to make peace. Jesus looked at the people in his time and says, you got me mixed up. You think I came to bring you together. I came to divide. What's he dividing? He's dividing the liars from the truth tellers. He said, in fact, he said, if you're going to follow me, you might have to hate your family. He's not saying be hateful to them, but he's saying you ought to have a love for me that's such, such a strong love. Uh, they might think you hate uh, because you're so devoted to me that nobody and nothing will pull you from my truth. He said, families will turn against one another over me. Somebody says, Pastor, you're telling me that God, God works that division? No, he doesn't work division. Rebellion in the hearts of men works division. Division in the New Testament was never blamed on the people preaching righteousness. It was blamed on them who came in and said there was an easier way. It's the rebellion of men and women's hearts that causes that divide. But look at this. It says, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now see, I need you to understand something. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. I could go, we could break down all the, all the reasonings in, in hermeneutics as to why this is going to happen. We could talk about figurative language versus real language. But, but, but let's just, just, just I'm going to ask you to trust me for this morning and understand this is going to happen. The heavens are going to open and there he's going to be. And in that moment, are you going to say, well, I did it my way? Well, Lord, I was kind of a Christian. I guess I was 60% in. This is when the king's coming to reckon. This isn't the broken Jesus on the cross. This is the king. Let's read what he says. <laughs> his eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. Why can't we know that name? Because we don't have anything in our language that can encapsulate uh, all that he is. 
Somebody said, Pastor, why does God have so many names? Because there's not one name that can tell us everything about him. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword from which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where he's not Buddha anymore. This is where he's not Krishna anymore. This is where he's not some other soothsayer, not some prophet. This is where we recognize, wait a second, he's God. And now I want to get to the part where we can say, well, swords and figurative language, but I want you to hear this. Now we come into really real language. Verse 17, I saw an angel. Standing in the sun. What's the angel there to do? The angel's there to declare something. I saw the angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly overhead. And he said, come gather for the great supper of God. God's about to throw a dinner for all the birds of the air. What in the world is he going to feed them? What's he going to feed them? Well, let's see. Verse 18 says, To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Say what, pastor? It says every person that isn't with him is now on the wrong side. And he calls together the birds of the air and says, fill your belly on the flesh of people that wouldn't bend the knee to me. Now I know we think that means Hollywood. And I know we think that means Vegas. And I know we think that means some Muslim nation. And I know we think that means something else. But that also means church attenders who thought you were manipulating the king of kings into letting you slide by with your secret sin and your halfway sold out life. He's the king. Pastor, are you upset? I'm just upset that people I love might be on the wrong side of this thing. I'm upset that there's a king coming and I've been called to proclaim his way. I've been called to make ready the path for the king. So what am I doing this morning? I've come to tell you, stop playing games with a safe Jesus and get your life in line with the king of kings. Pastor, that doesn't really fit my life. I'll be miserable if I give up this or that. I'd rather be miserable for 80 years on earth and spend eternity with him than have everything I want here and hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Verse 19, I saw the beast kings of the earth with their armies gathered together to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Every person living is going to play a part when he comes back. The question is, which part will you play? Will you, be, will you eat the wedding supper? Or will you be the Lord's supper? That's a real question. I said, Pastor, well, I'm a believer, and somebody told me that if I prayed and repented that I could never fall away. Well, the Bible says I better be careful lest I myself, after having preached the truth, become a castaway. The Scripture says examine yourself whether you be of the faith. Why am I examining myself? Because the king's coming. When he gets here, there'll be inspection. 
Pastor, this is the hard stuff. I was told come as you are. Absolutely come as you are. But once you meet the king, you line up with what he says. Because if you don't, then you're telling him that you're really the king. If you know that God's word says it and you refuse to live it, you're telling God, I don't care what you think, God. Verse 20, the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown into alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. He speaks the word. He spoke us into existence. He was going to speak life out of them. And by the way, the armies of heaven, we don't swing a sword. We're just there to watch the king. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Birds are so full of the flesh of people. Somebody says, Pastor, is this true? He said it. Somebody said, Pastor, when's it going to happen? I don't know, but I do know this. Go home and Google it. Go home and Google what's happening with the birthing rates of the birds that eat dead flesh in the Middle East. Go check it out. Why birds that used to give lay one egg are laying two, and those that used to lay three are laying four. Sounds like to me he's getting the birds ready. Sounds like to me it won't be long. And the king will be here. Somebody said, Pastor, they've been preaching that a long time. It's old-fashioned Sunday. I'm going to tell you something. They've been preaching it for a while, but it's closer than it's ever been. It's closer than it's ever been. Somebody said, Pastor, I don't know about all that. I don't know if he's really coming. Listen, it doesn't matter if you think he's coming back in an imminent rapture tomorrow or if your heart stops when you leave this place. You will meet the king. Let me give you some, a little bit more of a shock this morning if I can. One day he's coming to establish his kingdom in a physical sense, but you better hope you've bowed to him before that day. And I'm not talking about this playing a trick on God. I'm not talking about this being Christian enough. I'm talking about where he really rules your life. I'm talking about where when something comes out of your mouth, it's been weighed by what does the king think about this. I'm talking about when everything in my life comes back to the fact that I'm not my own, I belong to him. Because there's a place for people that refuse him. My God reigns, not just then, my God reigns right now. He reigns. He reigns. My God is still the king. Somebody say that with me this morning. He is king. He is king. He reigns. My God reigns in morality. My God decides what's right and wrong. Can I just help somebody this morning? We're going to close. But I need to let somebody know, we don't vote on what's right and wrong. We don't go to the polls and determine what's right and wrong. The Supreme Court, listen, they're going to rule in December. They're going to hear arguments about abortion. They don't get to decide whether abortion's right and wrong. My Bible tells me he hates hands that shed innocent blood. They don't get to decide that. They don't get to decide on marriage. My Bible tells me that in the beginning he created them male and female and for this cause they leave mother and father and cleave together and become one. And it's still true in 2021. They don't get to decide about gender. Pastor, what's, what's going on with gender? I want to tell you what's up with gender. Remember what happens in the beginning. God gives men and women identity. And here's the thing. It's hard to submit to a king if you don't even know your identity. Identity is under attack in this hour. 
But they don't get to decide gender. We don't get to decide gender. Can I tell you something else? Let's talk about work for a minute. I know it's popular in this nation. Some of you would do well to turn your eyes to some other nations where they've tried this thing called socialism that always ends with limited Christianity, that always ends with people taking advantage of the working people. It never goes well. Somebody said, Pastor, is this political? No, it's not political. How do I know it's not political? Because I don't know where they got this idea of a socialist Jesus, uh, but it's not in the Bible. Somebody said, well, in the New Testament, they shared everything they had. They had everything in common. In the New Testament, they willingly gave of their own property to the people they chose to give it to. That's a big difference than the government coming and taking it by the sword uh, and then distributing it for you. Furthermore, when they came to Jesus, they said, you ought to have given this perfume to the poor. Jesus looks and says, the poor you'll have with you always, but this woman's come to do what nobody else would do. He said, she has private property rights. Last I checked, God's a God of private property. Again, I don't know where we got this socialist Jesus, but my Bible still tells me in 2021 that if a person doesn't work, they don't eat. Can I tell you something? Let me just talk to you, young men especially. Young men, get your life together. Get a job. Don't tell me you can't find one, and don't tell me there's one that's beneath you. Can I tell you something? If burgers are beneath you, then owning the McDonald's is above you. Christians ought to be the best employee their boss has. Why? Because we do everything as unto the Lord. Stop stealing on your time clock. Come on, somebody. Stop taking that 10 minutes every day. That's not yours. Oh, my, we're getting rough now, aren't we? I want to talk about that for a minute. Let me talk, young men. Let me talk. Your children are your responsibility. Amen. They're your responsibility. Don't matter if you don't get along with mama, they're still your babies. Do your part. Amen. And I know, let me, let me just say this. I know we get excited. We start talking about gender. We start talking about abortion. We start talking about that stuff, and everybody gets excited. But let me just bring it on down home a little bit. Don't clap and praise when we talk about, uh, when we talk about homosexual marriage uh, while we're still supporting the idea of shacking up in the church. I'm going to tell you why the world did what it did with marriage. The, the Supreme Court didn't take marriage from the church. We gave it up when we started thinking we could get out of our marriage every time things got difficult and switch over to somebody else. And we had pastors swapping spouses and we were throwing them back in the pulpit, calling them men of God. Politicians didn't ruin marriage. The pulpit did. We think this idea where we're going to talk about the world, meanwhile we're doing it in the church. Let me take it a step further. Let me take it a step further. I'm going to go ahead and bring it on down. You ain't married, don't be spending the night at their house. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Because I'm going to tell you something. You spend enough nights at their house, something's going to happen you claim ain't happening, or you don't even need to get married because you don't like them that much. I hate to make it plain, but if you won't live with them, don't go on vacation and sleep in a hotel room with them for a week either. I hate to make it plain, but we wonder why God won't use us. God won't put his spirit in unclean vessels. There's a king coming. Are we serving the king or are we serving us? Let me bring it on down. We don't get to decide about things like race. My Bible tells me we all came out of Adam and Eve. My Bible doesn't tell me that, there's a, a, that, that a white person is better or a white person is worse. Or a black person is better or a black person is worse. I'm not going to raise my kids to think they're better 
because they're white. You don't raise them to think they're worse because somebody white did something stupid and ignorant years ago. I say we move forward in reconciliation together and walk in the kingdom of God and recognize that white and black are all beautiful together. At the same time, somebody told me, said, well, pastor, I heard so-and-so didn't want to come to church because you talked about racism too much. I said, bye. You think I'm joking. I'm going to tell you something. If you're racist, don't worry about it. You ain't got to worry about going to heaven with somebody that ain't your race. You won't be there. I, 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 can't, I can't help. I've, got, I've, got, I've just got to give it to you this morning. You probably should have known about Thursday morning this was coming. I cannot help but look around and say, when is the church going to line up with the king? We got people that will run out to the polling booth and vote for things that are absolutely against what God decrees and God declares. And you say, well, we want, well, you got to understand, they, they, they had a, this guy's just not, he's just nicer than somebody else is. Nice? While we murder six million babies? Nice. 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 While we put an abomination at the top of our agencies? Nice. Nice. While we thumb our nose at the God of the universe? Nice. Say, well, we can't have people to have those values. Listen, I don't care about attitudes. Go look at the values. Go look at the policies. Tell me what you find. I heard somebody say this week, they said, he was a madman. Well, Jehu was a madman, and he killed Jezebel. Church, there's a king coming. We better get our hearts right. We better stop going to the polling place and voting so I can get a few more handouts, so I can get a little more of this, I can get a little more of that. We better stop making our decisions based on the race we are. We better stop thinking we can live our life any way we want to live and act like we belong to him. You say, Pastor, you look like you're mad this morning. I'm mad at Satan. I'm going to tell you something. God pulled me out of deep sin. God pulled me out of dark sin. God pulled me out of heading straight for hell. And I'd rather go live that hellion life and go straight there than sit here and think I had something I didn't have. And I'll tell you this, and I've made up my mind, and I'm going to give you a recommittal right here. I'm going to stand in front of you and tell you this. There's a king coming, and there's going to be people in Rock Hill that go to hell from a church pew. But I promise you, you're going to have a hard time doing it from these. I'll promise you that. Because I would rather you get mad at me on a Sunday morning and go home and say, I didn't like what he said but I think he told me the truth. I'd rather you say, I'm going to go somewhere else and give my money and my tithe and do all that. And listen, let me tell you something. I'm a daddy and I got babies and I wonder about those things sometimes, but God will feed my babies if I'm faithful to his word. There's a world that's getting worse and worse. Jeff, would you come to the piano? There's a world that's getting worse and worse. I'm going to tell you something, church. Morality has gone down worse than we've ever seen it in this nation. Race is headed. We are headed into a worse divide than we've ever been in in this nation. We are headed into a worse place economically than we've ever seen in this nation. We're headed into a bad spot. There's only one answer, and that's the king. That's the king. And I don't stand here today and tell you all these things because I just want to come up here and, and get something off my chest. I tell you this because he's the king. And as the king, his word has to be our ruling document. And if I'm truthful, Brooke, there's stuff in this book. There's stuff in this book that I'd rather change. I'd rather get it out of here. I got friends and family members that this book says aren't lined up. If I had wrote it, I'd have probably done a few things differently. But I didn't write it. I didn't write it. 
His word's got to be our governing document. His will has got to be our authority. And nothing must take us from our service of Him. Nothing. Serving Him must be the number one priority in our life. I'm glad He reigns in mercy. And here's the beautiful thing. I, I want you to understand something this morning. There was a day that I walked into Dr. Javier Osterheld's office. And Dr. Osterheld looked at us and says, your daughter has this cancer, and if it stays there, it will kill her. And if we don't do this treatment, she will die. I didn't like it. It wasn't pleasant. It didn't feel good. I didn't leave that place that day thinking, boy, Dr. Osterheld's the best person I ever met in my life. Dr. Bambini said, I'm going to have to make a cut in her side. I'm going to have to deflate her lung. I'm going to have to sever a nerve that's going to leave her scarred forever. But I'm going to save her life. Wasn't a pleasant day when we met Dr. Bambini. But if they had not told me the truth, I'd have one daughter and a picture of a dead daughter right now. So I don't come here today telling you this because I'm angry at you. I don't come here today telling you this because I want to hurt you. I come here telling you this today because there's a king coming and I want you to be ready when you meet him. I want every part of your life to be ready when you meet him. If you're a gossip, I want you to stop gossiping before you meet him. Because if you meet him gossiping, you're going to be in trouble. If you're a liar, I want you to stop lying. Because if you meet him lying, you're going to be in trouble when you meet him. If you're a fornicator, I want you to stop fornicating. Because you're going to be in trouble when you meet him. If you're racist, I want you to stop being racist. Because you're going to be in trouble when the king comes. If you're not following him in the way you live out every part of your life, I'm worried for you, friend. That's why I tell you this. There's a king coming. We pray. Go back to that. Go to the end verse. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done. What's our prayer today? Let his kingdom come into my heart. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. I know I've preached hard to you this morning. But I promise you this sermon was no hotter than hell. I promise you this discomfort was no worse, not even an inch of how bad it would be for us to say, but Lord, I went to church, but Lord, I participated, but Lord, I did this and him to say, but I never knew you. So today I'm going to give an altar call. I'm not going to give an altar call for people who've never met him and people who have and all those things. I'm going to give an altar call that says simply this. I wonder, and I want you to think about this when you respond or don't. If you're not comfortable in the altar, I understand that. But I wonder how many people in this room will say, Pastor, I'm going to step out today and say, make a declaration of what truth is in my life. Could we stand? Today in this altar, we're going to fill this altar with one group of people, families, children, adults, whatever. But I want every person in this room that says he's going to be king of my life. I want you to step out, fill this front, fill these aisles. Let's make a public declaration. He's going to be king in my life. Could we come? Could we come? He will be king in my life. He will be king. In my life, he will be king in my life. He's Lord. Oh, he is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. Every I want to tell you this quickly. I think I've told you this before, but I want to tell you again. As we pray, 
There was a time when a king would come to a village and everyone in the village had to come out and, and show their fealty to the king. They had to take a knee. When they took a knee, they would put their hands together. The king would hold his hands open and they'd lay their folded hands in the hands of the king. And they would say, King, I'm your man. I'm your woman. And what that meant was, everything I own is yours. You need my boys for your army, you can have them. You want my girls for your court, you can have them. You need my cows to feed your belly, you can have them. I am yours. And the church said, if we're going to fold hands for the king, we're going to fold hands for the king. That's where we get folded hands and penitent prayer. So I wonder, all of us across this room, if we could just put our hands together and just make that our prayer. I'm yours. I'm yours. If that means some things have to change, I'm yours. If that means I gotta watch the way I talk, I'm yours. If that means I need to watch the way I interact on social media, I'm yours. If that means I need to work on my relationships, I'm yours. If that means I need to change some things, I'm yours. I'm yours. I belong to you. I am yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. Every area of my life, spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, everything is yours. Go ahead. He is Lord. Every area, your Lord, he has risen his hand from the dead, and he is Lord. Every dish now, every tongue of that Jesus Christ. Here's the beautiful thing. As we talk about connecting with God, this is a great place to start. We start with I'm yours. You are king over all. Now we begin to break through and we're beginning to get to that place where we can pray effectual prayer. So as we leave this place today, I want to encourage you to go with one thing in mind and that is, what am I doing today? How is this action pleasing or displeasing to my king? God bless you as you go. May the Lord, Lord bless you and keep you. Stop by the bake sale. Stop by the coffee shop. Those pictures are amazing. Go out to the courtyard and get your picture at the photo booth. God bless you as you go.